very quiet. So if any of our panelists would like to sing or dance or share some music while we're waiting, um, feel free to do so. Should have had some background music going on. I fear you might actually lose participants. <laughs> any of us. Like we're in the wrong room. <laughs> wrong meeting. <laughs> You know, that, that's a best practice that we talk about whenever we do meetings is to have music going on. And um, I'm sad that I do not, I'm not practicing my best practices right now. All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, if anyone is on the line right now, you can uh, change the view that you have for the panelists by going up to the top and changing that view. I have it set for everybody, but you may want to um, do that on your own if you'd like. So um, thank you everybody for attending today. Thank you to our panelists for joining us. We are super excited to um, be offering these webinar series to you. Uh, we are in a constant state of listening right now. This is uh, an unprecedented time, not only from what's been happening over the last few months, but also in the last few days. This is a, just a time that's just, um, you know, it's been building up for quite a while and we're all in this very confusing time, but we need to continue these conversations and keep listening to each other uh, to keep dialogues going. So today we're gonna be talking a little bit about the team dynamic and trying to really foster that that team that we have within our firms. Um, so we've brought you three fantastic panelists to share uh, some of the things that they've been doing and really trying to get to this next normal, uh, which is kind of how we defined it. So how we're leading our teams to this to be cohesive, uh, proactive, and really collaborative. So let's just go ahead and jump into this. I'll give a brief introduction for all of our panelists and um, I'm gonna share a fun fact that they've provided me as well. The first panelist we have today is Erin Ryan. Erin, do you wanna raise your hand so everybody knows who you are? So over her 15 year career, Erin's been fortunate to provide business development and marketing services to three different Amwell 100 firms uh, with these last 10 years being at McGuire Woods. Her role as a senior business development manager encompasses many facets, including revenue generation, practice development, coaching, innovation, and client relationship management. Erin has a passion for team management and organizational culture and frequently writes and speaks on business development, management, and professional growth. I know this because I've spoken with Erin a few times on these topics and she is phenomenal. She currently serves as the co-chair of the 2021 LMA Southeast Regional Conference, uh, which is themed around culture, success from the inside out. And she has her JD, so she was one of those people who went to law school and realized that um, she would like to be on the other side. So we're glad that she decided to make that jump. Uh, she has her BA in journalism and public relations, and she is a proud wife and also known as mommy to two small children who inspire and challenge her every day. She's based in Charlotte and she manages seven professionals. Her fun fact is that she has two actually. She uh, has attended 13 Bon Jovi concerts. She might poss possibly be their biggest fan. And her cousin was an original guitarist in the heavy metal band Slipknot. And I had not heard of Slipknot, but I did uh, go out and research it. Um, clearly she's Mr. Calling and she should be in a rock band of some sort. So next I'd like to introduce Tom Helm. Tom, give a wave. I mean, you were the only guy on the panel, so hopefully everybody picked up who you are. But Tom is the Director of Business Development for Brian Cave, a law firm of over 1,400 attorneys throughout North America, Europe, and Mideast, and Asia. And he leads the business development marketing team that promotes the 450 lawyer global corporate department. He's been in legal marketing for over 10 years and he previously served in the nonprofit sector. I met Tom several years ago in LMA where he served as the president for the Southeast chapter and he's most recently been a contributor to the LMA Education Advisory Committee. At Brian Cave, Tom's based in Atlanta and he manages a team of 10 professionals and none of those are actually in Atlanta. So a few fun facts about Tom. He loves to travel and he's enjoyed hiking in beautiful places from the North Georgia mountains 
to the faraway trails of England's countryside and the mountains of New England, or sorry, New Zealand and Norway. He also has a blind English Cocker Spaniel who enjoys listening to the great British baking show TV series. So I want a video of that at some point because I, I think that would be fantastic. Um, next, we have Mickey Hanlon. Mickey focuses on identifying marketing solutions. Did you wave, Mickey? Sorry, I didn't see you. Okay. Uh, Mickey focuses on identifying marketing solutions that drive innovation and client service while enhancing, enhancing brand loyalty and increasing firm profitability. She serves as the Senior Director of Marketing for Steptoe and Johnson LLP, where she sets the direction and oversees the implementation of the firm's marketing and communication strategies. Mickey also advises and collaborates with firm leadership, its lawyers, and the business development team to increase market awareness and drive lead generation. She has more than 20 years experience in the legal industry, and she aims to identify ways to improve efficiency and support the firm's marketing program to enhance strategic marketing communications and business development. Mickey is based in DC and she manages a team of 10 professionals. She also has two fun facts. Uh, during quarantine, Mickey and her husband are using their free weekends to educate their daughters on the movies of the 80s and 90s, which I am a huge supporter of. Have they watched um, Pretty in Pink yet? The girls don't like that. No. Not yet. no. It's That's on the list one. though. Uh, a, a less, she said less, but fun fact, she holds degrees from both USC's, the University of South Carolina and the University of Southern California. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we can recognize, pivot, and adapt to what this next normal looks like, how our firms are changing or redefining success, um, how you've personally defined success. I'm sure all of you on this um, in our audience today have lots of questions. Feel free to ask those and we're gonna address as many as we possibly can. And if we can't get to those, we will um, ask the panelists to share their thoughts and we'll provide those in a follow-up. So let's dive in and ask some questions to our experts. Um, the first question is uh, around just kind of your teams. What are you and your teams doing now that's working better than anticipated for your firm or team or department? And should you consider making those permanent? Nikki, let's start with you on that one. No, better might not be the right word to use. I might use the word smarter. I think we're working smarter now that we're at home than maybe we were when we were in the office. We're certainly utilizing the firm's collaboration tools that were always available to us, but we didn't deploy or employ the way we should. Um, we also, from a marketing operations perspective, we've been able to streamline some of our processes related to email marketing and events just to allow us to be more efficient given that we're not talking to each other on a regular basis. Uh, with most of our team being based in DC, we really lost a lot of that element of connection that we had on a, on a day to day basis. Um, the other thing, though, that I think we're doing better now than maybe we were before is uh, related to the human element of our team and of the people that we work with. Uh, we started a, um, a Friday morning virtual coffee that we call Chaos Kids and Coffee for the parents. We all happen to be mothers, but for the parents within our team. And I think it's been a really rewarding way to get to know some of our fellow teammates at a level that maybe we wouldn't have before because we were always so business focused. And that is certainly something that I want to continue to see us do as we move into whatever the next normal looks like, whether we're back in the office full time or we have some sort of a remote um, mixed type of schedule with our team. Great. Yeah, I think that, um, sorry, I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but those, you know, those soft skills cannot be understated. Um, you know, I, I hope that we don't have just pandemic personas where we are caring and we we see people as whole people and and you know we ask up front how are things going how you know how's your mental space um if those are just pandemic personas that's going to be really really sad um I, I hope that we do carry that forward and i think we're all thinking about that that remote working aspect and will that be permanent will it not will it be some 
some hybrid of office and and remote. And you know, as I was uh, laying around thinking about this the other day, um, I came to this realization. I think we should try to stop calling it working remotely. Um, you know, that really to me signifies there is a home base, and everyone not there is distant. Everyone not there is unplugged. Everyone not there is somehow bending the rules or getting a free pass in some way. Um, so I started in my head calling it flexible work environments. Um, and I, I hope that carries forward too from this to understand that people thrive in different environments. Not everybody thrives in an office or a cubicle or wherever we may work. They may not thrive, in fact, between the hours of eight and five. Um, and so now that we've had a taste of that, being able to, to kind of function in a way that works for us and in a way that that makes us most productive, I, I really do hope that, that that carries forward, at least that mentality around um, flexible work environments. Well, that brings up a good point. Are you working with your senior leadership team to kind of reimagine what the department should look like moving forward? Um, yes and no. You know, I, I don't know that we should call it reimagining. That feels very big. Uh, like we're kind of sitting down and putting pen to paper and reorganizing and and figuring out this this next normal in one fell swoop. Um, we, nobody has a crystal ball. We're all kind of figuring this out together in real time. Um, for us, I think it's more about being hyper aware of all of the moving parts, of all of people's challenges and obstacles, and ha you know, kind of always having this side eye over here on the market trends and making sure that the right people are doing the right things on our team, because that's going to look different and that's just going to evolve as we figure this out. Um, so, you know, if I kind of pan out in my mind, I see, well, our events team, that's probably gonna look a little bit different um, until we figure out if we're all gonna go back to conferences and large live person events and things like that. Um, so they're gonna evolve. This whole idea of the flexible work environments, that's gonna change probably how we hire, where we hire. Do, do, do particular hires have to be in certain offices or um, can we be a little more free with that? It's probably gonna impact how we manage. Um, you know, Mickey, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but taking away those physical advantages or disadvantages of being in the same office or next door or having access to your manager or your boss, that's all been, been taken away. And if we do continue in this, this flexible work environment, we're gonna to have to figure out what else is gonna be measured because you know that if you walk in the office and you see someone burning the midnight oil and in early and always nose to the grindstone, that subconsciously affects how you think they're performing. Um, and so if we take that away, just we have to we have to measure in different ways. And so kind of all those long-term things are gonna end up in a reimagined uh, a reimagined team, but we don't know what that is yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that to Aaron's comments <clears throat> yeah it's for our senior leadership team within our department we've really challenged each other to step up our game particularly around the outreach to our in, individual outreach to our team members our respective team members and we've learned so much from doing that you know, so for example I have a I've known a team uh, one of my team members who has a, a baby an infant and a toddler and although I've known that and she and her husband are in a relatively small apartment in Brooklyn, I can imagine what that looks like. But one of our uh, social hours or coffee chats we had as a team, I encouraged everyone to bring with them something, either show their kids, show their pet, plant they love, whatever it is, book they're reading. And um, Becky is her name. Uh, she joined the call sitting around the breakfast table with her two children in their high chairs and her husband. And I just thought that was one, so cute. And two, it just really gave a visual to what we imagine someone's going through. And so from the, for the senior leadership team, from our perspective, it really shed some light on everybody's in work environment is different. So these are, so I think to answer your question, Joe, I think in the future, we'll continue to engage our team members remotely and have more empathy to steal one of Aaron's words I heard her say in one of our calls. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about what that is, looks like going forward, or excuse me, later in this call. But I think it's just understanding that our world is, may not look the same as somebody else's in their work environment and even their schedule. So, it, you know, all of this is, 
sort of humanize people because you get a peek into their their lives, not just their backgrounds, but um, be a VC, but really what they're going through and often struggling with. And throw in COVID and all this, it just creates a more uh, challenging work environment. So I think just when I say empathy, that's what I mean. It's just really being plugged in and tuned into each of our team members. So there's, so that's more of kind of what Aaron touched on is the soft skills. The other piece to that, I think, is we've, we've tried to ramp up or increase our online training. And so training within our organization through our learning and development department and even within our department, we're identifying some programs and, and training topics that we need to deliver to be better managers for those of us who have direct reports, as well as better utilizing technology, which again, we'll, we'll be talking about more on this call. Mm -hmm. I, that's it's so great you mentioned that. I mean, I think one of my favorite things, and, and this, is, this shouldn't be my favorite thing, but the whole um, humanization of this, being able to see people in their home environments, it does really give a, just a new level to everyone, right? It, it just, it, it lets us see into people and kind of where they are. Um, I've enjoyed seeing celebrities, like where, how they live. And I'm like, oh, not much better than me. Um, but it's, it's really kind of neat to, to be able to take a purview into people's lives. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the programming and the professional development. Are you guys doing anything around that for your, for your firms, for your people, uh, especially within your marketing business development departments? Mickey, I'll, I'll ask you that question. Are we, we're training, are we training them? We try to do, we're trying to do a monthly lunch and learn where we talk about one topic or another or have someone from the firm come in and talk to the team so that we can try to embrace that learning environment while we're still stuck at home and trying to um, move forward as well. Um, it's still a work in progress. We don't have the most robust training program in, as a whole. So we, um, we are, are trying to um, sort of figure it out as we go along and do it on our own. Uh, so it's another added element to a day-to-day -day solution that we're, trying to, problem that we're trying to solve within our own department. Yeah, Joe, I'd, I'd also add, you know, just to be a little more specific um, in terms of topic, uh, topics, this is, a, this is a really good opportunity, whether or not you have a robust training program or learning and development department. I've worked at small firms where when I heard somebody say that at an LMA conference or on a call like this, I, I rolled my eyes and thought that must be nice. But it is a good time for, for regardless of your firm size and resources to really think um, what training your, your team members need or even yourself, you yourself needs. And it doesn't necessarily have to be driven through your own marketing or BD department. It could be in collaboration with you know, the human resources department or your IT department or whatever. So I think now is a good opportunity when, I don't know, we've started to see RFPs tick up a little bit. Um, so I, I won't use that, play that card and say it's slow going now. But uh, for those of you who do have a little extra time, it's good to step back and really think about what your uh, team needs in the way of training. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do a a plug for LMA here. Um, LMA has an online resource library, but they also have a BD assessment tool or a, a department assessment tool, which is really fantastic. And if you guys haven't checked it out and you're members of the association, please go do so because it, it is really good. It, um, it allows you to take an assessment and kind of learn where you need to develop your skills a little bit more. I took it and realized I am very, uh, even being in legal marketing for 20 years, I'm not very proficient in pretty much everything that I, um, that I did the, the test for. So it was a good learning experience, but it allows you to kind of drill in and, and go check out some different webinars and thought leadership. Yeah, so, that's a good point, Joe. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just yeah. saying the LMA body of knowledge is there. It's a great resource. And so it, it, it will save you a ton of time instead of reinventing the wheel as well. Um, so as, as we talk about your, your departments and firm leadership specifically, how is internal communications being played into how you evolve and continue to embrace this tele-network environment? Uh, I'll jump in on that one. Um, internal communications is it's such a funny thing. You know, before, before a crisis or outside of a crisis, it's sort of a, a nice to have. 
Um, you know, we think about, oh, that's great that we have a portal and we have an internet and we have, you know, we actually have a, a communications director who, who manages that whole function. Um, but over the last three months, it's been really interesting to watch just how clutch an internal communications function is. Um, I've watched it evolve. I've watched it evolve quite a bit, um, and I know that our team is behind all of this and, and kind of orchestrating. But you know, starting at the top, the frequency with which our firm management is communicating out to the firm, um, largely via 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 video messages, um, but also emails, also voicemails. It's just been amazing to watch. Um, so internal communications, you know, from from management down, um, but also we've been able to develop a few processes that I think help, help our team communicate with ourselves and with the lawyers. Um, one example is a nightly COVID email. Um, and Mickey, I think you guys do a similar thing here, but for a while there, it was a little hard to keep up with it all. The, the amount of the volume of that leadership being pumped out, whether it's via webinars or, or articles or videos or whatever, it's just a little hard to, to, to track and keep up with. So we have one person who puts together a nightly roundup of here are the things that went out today, here's who it went to, here are the things in the pipeline, and here's some ideas kind of percolating down here. And that acts as a, as a real nice notification process for people to jump in where they think they might have somewhere to contribute. We've seen a lot more um, cross-disciplinary jumping in on things because Lord knows that our clients aren't experiencing things in you know just straight practice area silos. Um, we've also developed a virtual event task force. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that the events function is just kind of on its head right now, and we all learned um, together. So we have this task force of, of people from the advanced team, people from the BD team, people from the competitive intelligence team, people from the IT team, and we're, we're all kind of learning together and sharing knowledge in real time instead of playing middleman or having one group chasing a rabbit hole down here and one group chasing a rabbit hole down here. Um, and we developed an early notification system for events as well, the event alert system, where we just have a distro list and a look. And whenever anybody catches wind of an event being conceptualized or planned, they blast it out to that list. And we have the benefit of learning and getting the knowledge of people who have been in different rabbit holes and who've demoed other platforms that we may need. And it's just been working, you know, I think we're only really a week or two into it now, but it's been working really, really well. Already there is so much more internal communication going on. Yeah, and I will just, I'll agree. I mean, we have, we do the same thing here we mentioned. We do a, a night email to all of the lawyers. Actually, I think to the whole firm, letting them know all of the alerts that we sent out and things like that. Our, our leadership has certainly done a much better job at communicating internally than we ever did before, uh, which has been a very, it's been refreshing um, because we always tried to push them, but they would never listen to us or they just, they were busy. It was like a nice to have, like Aaron said, it was something that they wanted to do, but they just didn't have the time to do it. So, but now they're, they're, they're making the time and they're making the time to think about what they're saying and how they're saying it. And I hope that my goal is it doesn't maybe continue with the same level of frequency when we start to reopen and get back in the office, but it still continues and they, they continue to engage and have those conversations. The other thing is as a firm, we rolled out, um, and I, I have, I have a really, um, wonderful working relationship with my counterpart in the IT department. So we tend to bounce ideas off of each other and think big picture ideas all the time. And when all of this started, we started talking about how we could better engage some of the um, groups within the firm that don't necessarily have a strong department leadership. And it's not because the leader's not there, it's because it's really big. And I, I'm thinking like the secretarial pools and the assistants who are just so broad, they work with their partners, they work with their lawyers, but they don't necessarily have the same structure that like a marketing department does. So we um, we actually launched Yammer, which is the Microsoft platform for, it's like an internal office Facebook almost, where we launched it and our um, all of our staff, staff, lawyers, everyone, are participating in this social network within the firm and talking about things and we created special groups for food and we created one for entertainment so people can share tv shows they're watching and then we have we have one for leadership where the leadership can post messages 
Um, but that's been really well received by those audiences that maybe don't have the same level of interaction that others do on a regular basis. So we've seen positive things come from an internal communications perspective. Sorry, I had myself on mute. Um, that's, that's great. And that kind of ties into the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is technology. Um, I had not heard of Yammer. We've been using Microsoft Teams and I see it advertised everywhere right now um, that people are using that and it's a pretty, pretty cool tool. Um, but I wanted to just kind of uh, engage the audience a little bit, ask a question. We have a poll for you all to um, take. So if you could um, answer this question, what types of technology are your firms implementing or exploring as we adapt to this new virtual landscape? Looks like a lot of people are exploring webinar virtual meetings, which is not a shock. Um, can you guys see these results in real time? Okay, I'll publish them in just a second. All right, so it looks like the webinar virtual meetings one out is something that everybody's kind of looking at. Next is podcast. No real surprises here, um, but let's ask our panelists um, a little bit about that, that technology that y'all are implementing. Um, are you and your team taking full advantage of firm technology and training? If so, tell us about it. If not, what's preventing it? Tom, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, we, so we, um, our firm uses WebEx for its webinars and internal meetings, uh, VCs, all of that. And so we have the technology, but I, what I realized is a lot of us, and I've been guilty of this, we haven't really taken the extra time to know how to use it. And there's some danger in that. It's, we've all experienced how frustrating it is to join or participate or even um, you know, share screens and that sort of thing. And part of us, are it's user error. We haven't taken that extra time to, to learn. So people have been vocal about that with our HR, excuse me, with our IT department. So they've sent out tips for due on a weekly or biweekly basis. So I'll use that as an example. That's a, that's a perfect case of, I think where we're headed as clients are, are starting, not only internally, people such as our partners with whom we work and each other, but externally we're using the same platform uh, for, like I said, our webinars. And I think people currently and will as time goes on have little if not zero patience for snafus and we'll get incredibly frustrated. And so the technology becomes part of the brand, so to speak. So people were to join this webinar and it's not over, I'm knocking on wood, but if something were to go wrong now, um, you know, it just reflects poorly on, on the organization's brand. So that's something that we have to think of. So there are different things to think about, whether it's WebEx or any other tool or technology we use, really taking an assessment and figure out, this ever, has everyone been trained? Have we engaged the vendor or service provider on that tool to ensure that they've done all the training they can for us? And most would welcome that opportunity. Uh, so I would encourage, you know, look at the tools you have and make sure they're the right tools. Maybe times are tight right now. Maybe it's time you don't renew licenses or, or contracts and, and instead switch out for technology that you need today and will need going forward a lot of the stuff we're using might be a bit antiquated for what we need. So I know that's, th that's something that people do regularly, um, but if it's been a while, now's a good time to, to take the time to do that. Yeah, I think that's really important from a firm perspective. I know um, I was running a webinar today with a client and my internet just went out. And so it's hard, right? I mean, everybody has those snafus, but I think there is some um, wonderfulness to everybody having a little bit of patience around that too, of, you know, we can't control, um, I can't control my teenager streaming videos while I'm trying to do work um, and, and shutting down my webinar. So I think that um, it's really interesting dichotomy of like looking at how firms are gonna look to enhance that a little bit. Um, yeah, it, 
Yeah, sorry, sorry, Joe. Yeah, one more thing to add is it's not just potentially user error, but if we're communicating with end users or the audience members or attendees, we should be absolutely clear on how to use the technology and the steps should be very simple and short. Yeah. Mickey, what about you? So I agree with everything Tom said. I think now is the perfect time to start to reevaluate the technology technologies we have, what we're using well, what we're not. Is there an opportunity to maybe change where you're spending your dollars? Um, I certainly don't have any extra dollars right now, but I'm already looking at some of those things in terms of how we can start to shift things around as necessary. We didn't have at Stepto we use on 24 for webinars. So our webinar platform was secure in marketing. The lawyers didn't have the ability to have regular video conversations with their clients. It wasn't something that the firm had rolled out. Um, this, this work from home environment forced them to push ahead faster than maybe they would have liked. But I think it's been for the best because the fact that our lawyers couldn't video chat with their clients on a regular basis, I just, I think it adds a whole new element to the client relationship when you can see somebody when you're talking to them. Um, I'm always surprised now actually when I get on calls with vendors who are using Teams or they're using uh, Zoom and they're not on video because, and, and I am the first one to say when I was in my office taking those calls, I was never on video. <laughs> but it's shifted my perspective greatly. And I do think there's a lot of value in the face-to-face -face communication, even if it is over a computer. Yeah. Mickey, I think some of that value is because we have video now, we can't multitask. I mean, that's always what I was doing when I wasn't on video, right? So if, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, fingers crossed, we're all listening a little bit more too. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And anybody that I coach now, I do videos with, and it's a different conversation than before. Um, so all of you out there that do coaching with your attorneys, um, push them to do the, the Zoom calls or Teams, because it does add a different di dynamic. Tom, could you guys repeat that? that? Yeah, could you repeat that? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> um, all right, so does your department need to consider other tools or technology to better complement, you know, kind of what this working from home environment looks like? Oh, I, I, um, I think we always need to consider different tools. I think we always need to be looking ahead at what maybe is in the pipeline and what's to come. And if we're not, we're going to fall behind. Um, I have a long wish list of things that I'd love to implement for our team and for our department and for the firm as a whole. And some of them aren't even necessarily mine in the sense of I would be the one implementing them. They're things I think the firm needs to do and the things that I think the firm should think bigger about at times. But um, to focus on my team is where I can really spend my best efforts right now. And um, I, you know, I'm looking at, we don't have a, core, a good knowledge management tool at Steptoe, and that's certainly a big outlier and missing piece. And I think we need to focus on and figure out how we can maybe implement that. Um, the other thing I'm looking at right now, given the amount of thought leadership that we're doing and the amount that we're pushing out onto the website, um, our our website search capability doesn't generate the results the way we would want them to. So I'm looking at maybe ways that we can overlay a new search platform on our current website in order to enhance the end users um, visits when they go to search for something that they're looking for. So there's all sorts of things that we hope to get money for, but um, we'll have to see what we can like Tom said earlier, what we can shift and how we might be able to change our technologies a little bit to be able to secure the dollars that we need. Erin, how about you? Uh, you know, I, I really think that McGuire Witches, they've done us well. They've done us, they've done well, good by us, whatever the saying is. Um, we're lucky to be very resourced in the technology department, um, you know, whether it's Westlaw Edge or Cap IQ or PitchBook or Foundation, there's some, um, you know, interaction. There's just no shortage of technology. I think to Tom's point, what we haven't done well is learn how to use them all and learn how they work together and learn what purposes 
they serve. Um, ironically, the one gaping hole that I found in the last three months is that we don't have a great Zoom imposter platform. So because of all the Zoom bombing um, and the security issues, we, we aren't allowed to use that for, for client facing activities. Um, we can internally, but but nothing beyond that. And so, I mean, Zoom got it right. There is really just, we haven't found a great replacement for what Zoom does with the breakout rooms, with the polling, with the, even as simple as, as being able to do grid view or gallery view instead of speaker view. There isn't a tool that I can find that isn't, you know, within our price range or it wouldn't be a huge purchase price that serves all those needs. And it's what we need most right now. Um, so if anybody has any tips or tools that work well for them um, as a Zoom replacement, please let me know. I would love your insights. I know a couple of you guys were talking about foundation too, as something that you guys were implementing within your firms. Has anybody gotten very far along with that? And, and if so, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I've heard great things about it. Foundation is great. Um, it is, it's been game changing for us. And we are, I would say we're about a year and a half into, I don't know what you probably can't call it a rollout at that point, but um, we have, our, our jobs have just fundamentally changed from everything from, from proposals down to chambers. It just makes things easier because unlike any other tool that at least we've had at McGuire Woods, it plugs into all the right places. It pulls in all of the right information that we need to do our jobs well. Um, and I don't want to turn this into a foundation commercial, but um, suffice it to say that having an enterprise-wide knowledge management system that hooks in with, with billing, with HR, um, with all of the things, the people things and the, the, the process things that we need and typically have to go into different pockets of the firm to get, pulling that all in with the overlay of business development and using that data to to just gain immediate intelligence into what we've been doing for clients, how long we've been doing it, where we've been doing it, who's been doing it. Um, it has literally changed my life for the better. <laughs> Jill, we're not, we're not as, at our firm as far, as far along as Aaron, it sounds like, but we, we have been using it for quite some time with certain practice groups. Um, and we're in the process of rolling that out more broadly. Uh, but there's, you know, just hearing about foundation reminds me, if, regardless of your firm size, you, you may have team members who aren't as busy right now, who may be able to flex that muscle if that's something they're interested in, they can dive in to do, help do an ass assessment needs based on you know, technology or whatever it is for your department or your individual team. So now's a good time to maybe ask them to do that. They'd probably welcome the opportunity to, to have a crack at it. Um, and even if, you know, you're already using foundation or whatever tools you have, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, is making, it is really exploring what other features aren't being utilized or if there's a, another service provider that can subsidize what's already being done to make a more complete offering, better user experience across the board, whether it's clients or internally. And now's a good time to do that. Tom, have you been asking your team members about what their needs are for technology and how they engage in those tools? Yeah, I think it's not just technology, but just how they function <laughs> or prefer to communicate and, and do their jobs better. So yeah, it gets back to earlier when we were saying, picking up the phone and talking with individual team members. I mean, that's something we always do, right? Or if they're in your office, you have one-on-ones with them. That's nothing new, but really doing more of that now especially with the unrest going on and COVID and people are unsettled and unnerved. Um, but so using that as an opportunity for the personal side of things, but on the business side of things, back to your question. Yeah, I think, I think so. We're, we're having these discussions. Some of them we're already working on as a department. Others are new ideas. And um, for instance, when I'm on the phone with even our most junior team member, if, if, if she has an idea, um, uh, don't just raise uh, a problem or an issue, but what's a suggested solution for that? And if they haven't already thought about that, encourage them to go off and do some thinking and maybe some research to come back to see what the needs are. And then maybe we can roll that into whatever the broader plans are for the department as we um, are utilizing what we already have or assessing what we need going forward. 
that was a long answer to your question, but um, yeah, on a variety of levels, certainly are. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, it's same sentiment as Tom. You know, I don't think that we typically just have technology focused meetings where we say, hey, is everyone, is everyone all set? Um, usually they're gonna say yes or strong no's, but it's built into the culture of our team and, and the, the tenor of those conversations that frankly right now do open with, how are you, how are you? Um, with everything going on, how are you? And then eventually leading into, you know, what obstacles are you facing? Are there things that you're trying to do that just we're not able to quite get there? Or, um, you know, I see, I know that we have this goal together, but are there technological or, or team, you know, dynamic issues that are keeping you from achieving those? So it's all kind of wrapped into, are you able to do your job well? Um, and are you able to do it efficiently? Um, so again, that's kind of a long, a long answer to, it's just, we can't divorce management and good team culture from, from technology even. It's, it's entwined in everything. And people, even at the most junior level, should feel like our doors are open to come and say, I've really been struggling with this. Um, you know, how, what am I missing here in terms of technology? And one other final note um, before, I, before I stop talking, I know I get really excited about this kind of stuff, but I've also trying to been, I've, I've tried to really consciously force different groups of our team to talk to each other. So I always welcome problems, you know, yes, come to me if you have needs, but have you talked to your peers about how they have been tackling these issues? Likely you're not the only one doing this. So Tom, to your point, if a, if a junior coordinator comes to me and says, I can't do X in this technology, I will send them back out into <laughs> the field and say, talk to the other six or seven coordinators and see if they have any advice for you. Because much like the event virtual event task force, we're all in different rabbit holes and we're all exploring different things and we all are being chased down with different requests. And so we're all learning different things at a different pace. And there's really no excuse for not having that knowledge being shared across peers and across the team. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing at the risk of our facilitator telling us to move on to the next topic. Um, <laughs> you know, for those of us who manage teams, now's the time to be proactive uh, and ask the question, what's to, with our team individually and as a group, what's frustrating that should not be frustrating? And by the way, we should all ask ourselves that in every aspect of our lives and, and really assess, all right, if that's frustrating to you, why? What can we do about it? And often they may have some ideas where you can embolden them to go off and, as Aaron was saying, you know, seek out some solutions. So it's a way where you don't have to take the burden on yourself to figure out how to accommodate people in different ways. Well, and I think that goes back to evaluating your technology, right? If, we, if technology isn't helpful anymore and it's causing more problems than it is solutions, you need to get rid of it. Like, don't keep it just because it's the solution that you have. Think about what, how can you change it? How can you fix the problem and move forward? Because if it's only causing more trouble than it is help, um, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. the time and energy your team is putting in. It's not worth the maintenance and management you're, you know, you're trying to do from a technological perspective either. That's so true. I mean, this is the time that we need to reevaluate all that stuff, right? And kind of reset um, what expectations are and research what opportunities are. Um, Aaron, you said you're kind of a, a excited about something. I love data. Data is, I, I love data. It's one of those things that really kind of makes me a nerd and I like to dive in it and get lost in it. But I think it really does help you kind of inform decisions for the future. So I want to pose a question to you guys around data and whether or not you're using data for your department to help kind of drive those strategic decisions. Um, from our perspective, we're starting to. I think that we've been slower to adapt just because of the pace, but um, what I found, the pace that we increased during the 12, the 12 weeks we've been off, we are forced to look at the data because where are we wasting our time? Where are we spending our time? Where are the lawyers spending valuable time? So I am working with my team to, we've been trying to implement Power BI within our department, which is a data visualization tool for a while. Um, I've been really 
spending as much time as I can really working in it. Um, we can integrate it with interaction. We can integrate it with our website analytics platform, and we can eventually, we're, Vuture is getting ready to start an integration with Power BI too. So the data that we're going to be able to get and have is gonna be great. It's just gonna be able to create, we now need to work on creating those visualizations that work for the right people, right? Leadership's gonna to wanna to see one thing. Practice group leaders will probably wanna see a different thing. And then our team, a whole different, um, you know, slice of the data and how it's looking. So that's where we're headed is to really start to evaluate that and try to figure out how we can provide the best analytics at a high level to our teams. And then ultimately, my next goal would be to figure out how to build some engagement scoring into it and help to potentially identify future leads for the BD team to take to their lawyers. Gamifying, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, so yeah, I agree with Mickey. One of the things where data definitely needs to help drive decisions, right? It gives, especially for, we need to be doing that anyway as a best practice, but also we give some concrete support and evidence when you go to your attorneys and make suggestions or recommendations to steer the ship in a new direction, perhaps, or even on a granular level for individual thought and leadership pieces. The data is already available. I keep talking about vendors and service providers, but for those of you subscribe to JD Super or Lexology or whatever tools you have around thought leadership, and man, has there been a ton of thought leadership around COVID. Uh, I think we're past, I think we've already all acknowledged there's just too much noise out there. So we, I think we've all gotten smarter about what we're publishing. Hopefully we all are. Um, so we're using some of the data um, around some of our thought leadership pieces through third party sites, but also our own um, and our own internal platforms. And then it's really getting back to the basics. One of my colleagues and counterparts uh, who heads up the litigation department, Rebecca Whistler, who many of you on this call, I'm sure know, um, is she's, she has her team, and when I say getting back to the basics, this won't be anything earth shattering to most of you, but she, she has her team tracking a webinar and teleconference registrants weekly, and particularly around COVID, but also beyond just COVID topics or issues. Um, but then they take that data to go back to their attorneys and the, the litigators and are having discussions around those and figure out what language they need to tweak and, and I think comparing that also within what's already oversaturated in the market. So again, it, it's, it's a good time to dust off the data or find the data nerds. If you're not that person, so be it and empower and embolden somebody on your team or within the department who you know, nerds out on it like Aaron and Jill does. Um, but now's a good opportunity for them to, to be pulled into the mix if they're not already. Well, I will give a shameless plug here. We have built technology to help with data and marketing, basically like project management to market the marketing department. So call me if you want any information sure. on it. Um, are any of your teams using metrics around marketing media activities? Um, really those KPIs, and if so, what kinds of things are you tracking? I know, Tom, you mentioned the webinar traffic, uh, which gives great analytics. Anything else that you guys are tracking? I think we're, we're tracking our conversion rates with our webinars and our events, too, in terms of people register all the time, but are they actually attending? And then if they do attend, are they getting our newsletters and are they are they engaging at a different level besides just attending that one webinar? We've also done a couple of different series of thought leadership pieces and then a webinar to follow through the COVID crisis. And you know, that's another area to, to look at the analytics to see who has read the various things and attended the webinar. Because I think you can start to spot and track some of those potential opportunities, at least to pick up the phone and call the person or send an email and say, I, I know that you attended this webinar and you've, you've gotten all of our alerts on it. How can we help? Is there a way we can help? Can we answer more questions? And I think just starting the, it helps the lawyers start the conversation um, in, a, in a more meaningful manner than maybe just picking up the phone and calling somebody that they want to talk to but haven't talked to in a while or don't know very well. 
Yeah, I think I think the lawyers are probably more receptive to paying attention to the data now since we've gone away from sort of as you just alluded to, Mickey, the in-person stuff, not only events, but client visits, um, business development meetings, um, you name it. Those in-person visits have dried up at this time. And so um, everything's web-based and is able to be, not everything, but most things are web-based and able to be tracked. Um, so I think you, you have the attention uh, and, and for some people who may not have really paid attention to that stuff in the first place. But yeah, the whole, in, in just thinking externally, when we talk about the whole user experience to the life cycle of the engagement, whether, you know, for, for the variety of tactics and activities we do with our clients, we should also be, and I'm saying this to myself too, as a runner, we need to be really um, uh, stepping up our game to do the same thing internally in how we engage our internal clients, partners, and lawyers. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Joe, but it just got me thinking that you know, now's a good time to, to really you know, assess what, what data is available and what metrics and KPIs are available and do a good job of not just gathering that information, but presenting it to within the department, um, sharing that in a easily the digestible way, but also with the partners the same way. I mean, there's little patients to sift through a bunch of data. It's our job to make sense of that for them, as, just as we should be doing with our clients when we um, advise them on things. So um, I have a challenge to anybody out there. If, if you really want to effectuate change, get your department to start tracking their hours on things. Um, because that's how our attorneys think. They think in the billable hour concept. And when you can start putting real ROI around an initiative, whether that's a good thing, you know, whether you're um, responsible for bringing in more money or it's, it's an area that you want to push off. For instance, at my last firm, we did all of our tickets for the firm and I had somebody tracking their hours and over a month, they spent 40 hours on tickets. Um, Half of those were personal requests. So, you know, just very easily tracking how much she made and how many hours she spent. That was a real hard number that I could give my, my leader and I got rid of tickets. So there's really great, powerful information in that data. And I know it's kind of a pain, um, but they understand that when you're able to, to translate things into the hour for them. Sorry, Erin, I don't know if you wanted to, to speak no. on that. No, go ahead. All right, so we've come to the rapid fire uh, section um, of our session today. The first is a question around, are the ways that we can jumpstart our teams when we get back to our next normal in order to light a fire under them and get them excited about our firm's mission? So you guys have one minute, go. One minute each? Yeah. Oh, I'll go first. Or, or not, like 30 seconds, whatever you want. Just very concise. All right, concise, rapid fire. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, find a way to highlight all of the things we've been able to accomplish as a team in this time we've been physically apart. Um, we're all just sort of running around, doing our own things inside our own homes, dealing with our own lives and our own worlds. And to be able to come back and say, look at what we did together, even though we are apart, I think would be really inspiring. Um, and then the second thing is, I think when it's safe to have an in, in-person in meeting with all the, the functions of the team, because now that we've built strong virtual bonds, um, you know, I say we double down and, and keep those kind of really, really fortify those with with face-to-face -face bonds. Um, and if it's not feasible, then figure out some virtual in between to do it. But that would be my goal. Awesome. Tom? Yeah. I'll just tell you the thing I believe that needs to permeate everything and everything we do, particularly when it comes to working with our teams. And by the way, if you're managed by someone else and you're you know, have a boss or supervisor, um, you can give this feedback as well. You need to communicate as much and as often as possible. And even, and, and even if you're communicating, I don't have an update, but here's what I know. People appreciate that. That's how they get engaged. And, and can champion the mission that the firm has or your department's goals. They, they'll rally behind those if you're communicative and um, transparent with how you got there. I don't have a lot to add. I agree with both 
Shakespearean in Tom in terms of what we need to do. And I don't know that we would call this lighting a fire in home when they get back. I, I think we've been so busy and been doing such an amazing job over the last 12 weeks as I, my own team that I just want to reward them for all of their hard work and help commend them for what they've done and help keep rolling the ball. I think they've seen, I'm speaking on behalf of them, but I think they've seen the value that they're adding to the marketing department so much more highlighted now than maybe they had previously. And I just want that to continue. I want them to know how valued they are. Oh, you're on your I'm on mute. I had a really great comment there. <laughs> um, what's the best advice you can give to your colleagues who are leading teams? Tom, you want to go? Yeah. So I think two things. One, have, again, empathy, uh, encourage not only for ourselves, but for our team members, self care. Um, realize that, you know, especially now in this environment, it's put a lot, even a lot of perspective on what we do. So really take the time to carve out self-care, time to give ourselves self-care uh, in whatever way that means is meaningful to each individual. Encourage them to do that, including take their time off that they have, vacation days. I mean, that's critical, even if they can't go anywhere. Mickey, how about you? Yeah, I agree. And I, I sort of pulled up four points that I'll hit on what Tom said too. Um, we need to lead by example. Uh, I think that I never ask my teammates to do something that I wouldn't do myself, uh, no matter how small or big the task is. Um, I want to continue to empower and trust them. I, d I think we succeed as a team because we've, we trust them. And this, this, this situation has created more need for trust than ever before, I think, because we need to trust that they're working and doing their job. Um, make decisions with, the, with your people in mind at all times, have the empathy and remember that everyone has different elements that are being thrown at them. And then the final one was, don't be afraid to embrace discomfort. We all know we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. And it's not easy and it stinks, but it's where we grow the most. Right. Y'all are good. Um, for me, yes, to all of the things. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and also I would add, be aware. You know, I'm just like, I'm hyper aware right now of how my boss is communicating with me and how our firm management is communicating to the firm, which really is their team. And just taking notes, you know, what worked, what didn't work so well, how can I emulate that or change course in my little corner of the world, um, my little corner of the firm, and just sort of taking in all of that information, all of those data points and all of those, all of that grayness around how we function as, as humans interacting with each other and, and hopefully spitting out the other end, something that's as good as I can, as I can do. And I think that's all we can really hope from, from our leaders and our managers. That was great advice, everybody. Um, before I wrap up, we, ha we did have a question from the audience. I wanna ask you guys, has anyone incorporated more video into your communications and BD activities? Definitely. Yeah. All the time now. The lawyers are finally not afraid to sit in front of a camera and they're doing it from home, which is kind of ironic because we had a whole setup in the office and we couldn't get them <laughs> to sit in front of the camera. <laughs> Tom, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Darren. Oh, um, one example came straight to the top of my mind when I read that, uh, that question. And that was um, taking really low hanging fruit. So what we did is, is particularly with our healthcare, um, our healthcare department chair, she's comfortable in front of a camera. She's gorgeous and well-spoken and all the things that make someone comfortable in front of a camera. But we took some of her thought leadership pieces that she'd already sat with, already spent a lot of time with, already kind of juggled around in here quite a bit. And it was so easy for that to come out into a very short two or three minute 
summary of the article and that it just made it sort of served itself up like hey i'm i am a person i'm amber i'm i'm i know a lot about this stuff here's what this article is about and what i've learned if you want more information click here into the full article and then subscribe to our email list and then join our webinar um and it just sort of domino pieces fell but video was was something that we had been missing for a long time yeah nothing bad Jill. i could go on all day about video but we'll talk offline okay no, we're out of time. Well, thank you everybody for attending today. Thank you to all of our panelists so much for taking your time and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with everybody. Um, I want to plug our next webinar. It will be on June 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have Sam McKenna, Mike Miller, and Stephanie Hendricks talking about positioning your firm for growth. And because this uh, whole series is titled Thirsty Thursday, we like to end with a cheer, um, a toast for everybody. So my toast for everybody is, um, and it's kind of in light of everything that's going on today. It's, it was first said by Benjamin Franklin, and it's in honor of social justice, inclusion, and change. Be at war with your vices, at peace with your neighbors, and let every new year find you a better person. Cheers. So stay safe and stay, stay well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jill. Yeah.